Welcome back to Bygone Relics and the C. Thomas Printer Cooperative, a place to make you think, make you remember, and make you smile. One of my favorite things about writing a blog and doing a podcast is that I am constantly on the hunt for new information and new sources. I like reputable information sources for facts and figures, assuming, perhaps unrightly so, that they have fact-checked and their data is trustworthy, even though I know government data are anything but. However, at times, when I am thinking more macro, I sometimes like to visit the sites less traveled, if you will, and I came across a site that I want to, to visit for more information if today's topic interests you. Austerity Jones used to get mad when I would send my visitors away, but I stand resolute in being interesting, and sometimes other sites are very thought-provoking, and I will not be selfish about good information to think upon. I liked it, and I hope you do too. It comes from the Of Two Minds blog of one Charles Hugh Smith. I have just started reading some of his information, and I don't know whether he is a kook or a kindred spirit, but I really liked his post entitled The Decay of Everyday Life. He made four very thought-provoking points, but I'd rather spin my own yarn at this point about them as I pondered them a great deal this week. First, quote, The balance between labor and capital has been skewed to capital for 50 years, end quote. We have talked about where this leads, Marie Antoinette getting her head chopped off. In the 1970s, labor and unions still had a very big footprint across the American capitalistic structure. In a way, it was a good thing they did because the American worker had a larger percentage of the American pie than they do today. Manufacturing and industrial production was still high, and many good-paying jobs in the middle class could support a much larger family than today. What happened was this. With the gold standard being abandoned in 1971, the dollar and credit were free to flow, and flow freely they did over the next decade, with inflation going higher as the baby boomers reached their prime house-buying years. They bought washing machines, lawn mowers, etc., etc. However, companies had high borrowing costs and the costs of labor were unpleasantly high. The times they were a change in, though. Look at a company like Nike. Phil Knight was peddling shoes out of his car in the 1970s, but he didn't start making any real money until he went to Asia and the cheap labor that beckoned. Trade was open with other countries and workers in other countries were a lot cheaper than in America. There was less regulation and the cost to build factories were cheaper in Asia. And in a blink of an eye, Bruce Springsteen's blue collar army of workers were being replaced by the parents of what would end up being the Gangnam style takeover. Toyota was importing more cars because they produced what the American worker wanted. Sony the same. And eventually most of our manufacturing and electronics and even textiles moved out of this country. This caused wages here at home to decline as more and more people were laid off from their good jobs, but the executives and capital got richer and richer, and their cost of goods sold dropped and margins got better. Interest rates began dropping in the 1980s, and for the last 40 years, capital has gotten bigger and cheaper, and the American worker has gotten further and further behind. 93% of all stock market wealth today is owned by the top 10%. Private pensions have disappeared and a 401k plan with limited options and a soon to be bankrupt social security system is all that is left for the American worker to look forward to. Rather than vote the people out who game the system and enrich and enrich themselves, they got distracted by booze, ball games and Baywatch. The second item of note from Smith is, quote, Process and narrative control have replaced outcomes as the operative mechanisms and goals of the status quo, end quote. If you listen to earnings calls with major companies like I do, the narrative control is the most valuable asset in the company. They outright lie, fudge the truth, pull your leg, tell you a tall tale, and talk about anything but the crappy numbers their company just put up. The spin is so important. Never answer the question. Just answer your canned and practiced answer, and eventually people will stop asking you and they will lose attention. That's it. That's the game. 
Even our favorites here at the CTPC, like Warren Buffett, preach stick with the process. Warren famously bought his first stock in 1942 and has become the world's greatest investor. Now, if you drop me into 1942 and I saw a country on the gold standard with immense manufacturing capability, clean and respectful cities, an educated workforce bound together by God and culture, I would have bought the market and went into margin for more. Today I see us exporting dollars and war, importers of damn near anything else, a society with cities that border on unlivable and open-air drug den soup kitchens. I see a society that's high on drugs, prescription and illegal, deeply indebted, morally lost, that doesn't even know what gender it wants to be this week. Buying the market in that long-term environment is a little bit different, Warren. Companies used to reward executives at 15 to 20 times the pay of the frontline worker, and now it is 250 or 300 to 1. They use financial engineering and options to reward themselves, so stock buybacks and layoffs are a good thing to their bottom lines. They give themselves raises and bonuses, and the American worker gets left further and further behind. This leads into Smith's next point, quote, the dominance of monopolies and cartels has fatally, fatally distorted markets and politics, undermining the foundations of everyday life, end quote. Walmart creeped across the heartland with better supply chain management and broke the backs of every single downtown and small town America. Abandoned buildings line the downtown, while out on the main highway or interstate there is a shiny new Walmart hawking cheap consumer goods from Asia. Always low prices are their mottos, and because the American worker was getting left further and be further behind every two weeks at payday, Walmart become, became a standard bearer for Americana. The Main Street entrepreneur moonlighted with a blue vest for medical benefits. America is now at the pricing mercy of just a few brands. In the last few years, Americans have been forced to pay whatever Target has wanted to charge. Target announced they are marking down 5,000 items this week, which is good for the consumer, you would think, until they realize that Target is about the last store standing between Walmart and total world domination. Is that scary enough for you? And I still can't get them to open enough lines with checkers. I refuse to do self-checkout because I'm creating jobs in America, damn it. That is bad enough at the consumer level when everything has become Target or Walmart, Pepsi or Coke, Apple or Samsung. I miss the days of roaming a Woolworths with a mug's root beer and checking my pager. But competition is dying a death of high barrier to entry, unbelievable capital disadvantage, and political favors. When Walmart is allowed to stay open during COVID, but the local store must close its doors, I became embarrassed for Americans. The great nation that flipped the bird at the British and dumped their tea into the sea just bent over and said, thank you, sir. May I have another? The whippings will continue until we dissolve into a pile of hair dye, nose rings, and false entitlement, or people start demanding better of themselves and their elected officials. They first must pay attention, and they aren't even remotely there yet. Why? Well, the last point sheds some insight on that. Quote, the dominance of digital communication in everyday life has increased the unpaid shadow work we're forced to do and inject new forms of narrative to control, digital hypnosis, addiction, and a derangement into daily life, end quote. Wow, I think he nailed it. The longer we let our brains dissolve into reels, TikToks, twits, posts, likes, and avocado toast selfies, the more it will be a challenge to change. Ivermectin is a horse dewormer and anyone taking it should be tarred and feathered, said the media. Well, Joe Rogan fought back and said, my doctor recommended it. Not the airbags with airbags from The View. Oops, now Chris Como is taking it and they are finding out that it performs quite well. The retraction is never as loud as the accusation, now is it? I might be surprised in 20 years if we don't look back at this age of phone use and go, man, that was a huge mistake. Kind of like we do now at smoking. If we follow these digital dumbed downing devices to their bare essence, we see that it is all about selling and moving products. 
98% of Facebook's revenue comes from advertising, and they are doing it well. Amazon is selling you so much stuff you don't, need, you don't need that thieves steal from porches, and no one really bothers to do anything about it. If you were still paying a little more and buying less, you could walk into a store on Main Street. But no one wants to do that either. This is the narrative control. Don't talk to a cashier. Be your own cashier and let us cut jobs and save money while we make you, our customer, work. Narrative control. People you have never met like your photo of your outfit and it makes your day. But if someone says something mean, it can ruin your day or make you suicidal. These digital do-nothings are not important, people. I'd rather have a couple of ride-or-dies than a passel of likes, followers, and people that hit that little bell icon. That's why I haven't asked you to subscribe, follow, like, or bored you with advertising. Outcomes matter, not digital begging. I could sit here all day and blow smoke up your skirt that I have all the answers, but I don't. I just have lots of questions, and I find out the more I ask questions, the more I figure out. I hope you do too, whether you like me or not. Maybe just maybe... We make this country a better place if we smarten up a bit. It needs it. My favorite new narrative is tipping in America. I was out getting something to eat. The order came up and I paid with a card, which I tend to do at large chains, but not mom and pop restaurants. I will save ma and pa kettle the 3% fee, but the franchise food establishment get me points on my credit card as the trade-off. But I digress. The cashier with a nose ring and black lipstick looks at me and doesn't say a word. I order and I say that will be all. She turns the credit card terminal out towards me while another worker brings me my food and also doesn't say a word. The terminal listed four gratuity options, 15, 20, 24, and 28%. I thought to myself, the stones on this cashier for even asking. I don't get a greeting, a thank you, a smile, any words at all, but she wants a gratuity? Oh, mercy me. Give me a Main Street diner where I can get a career waitress named Margaret that has a coffee pot in one hand, a green pad in the other, and somehow manages to get your order right every time. I will tip her 28%, but the entitled mute, sadly for her, got the goose egg. I didn't even feel bad, but resolved not to even frequent the establishment again. Pay your workers more if that is what it takes. But that experience of not being talked to, I can get it home for free. This is how we should be treating politicians and elected officials. Once burned, twice shy. But no. We just keep trotting out the same candidates that start eroding the lifestyle of the American worker in the 1980s. Seriously, some of them are still around. And if you go into a Ben and Jerry's, you might meet one. If you go to a closed hair salon during COVID, you might meet another. If you attend a Kentucky-Iowa college basketball game, you might meet another pair. These octogenarians keep voting themselves larger and larger examples of largesse, and we still don't take much notice, less offense. Ivan Bosky died this week, and he was a 1980s corporate raider and jailed for insider trading, but we watch the stock returns of Congress and just shrug. 82% of Americans want term limits in Congress, but we can't be bothered with caring. Our apathy is born from our distraction. We are distracted by devices, dumbasses, and deliveries from Amazon. We need places like this of twominds.com blog to conjure up a conversation with a real friend, maybe discuss something important for a change, and God forbid have a real human interaction. What? That sounds awful? That is because you might be out of practice. Sincerely yours, C. Thomas Printer. On this date in history, 64 years ago to be exact, one of the largest earthquakes ever recorded struck Chile, killing 5,700 people. Also born on this day, another deceased corporate writer of the honest variety, T. Boone Pickens. Thank you for listening today, and you can find all of our articles and more on our website, cthomasprinter.com.